Uh, thank you, everybody, for staying here so late in the day. Uh, maybe it's appropriate. This is a late news uh, paper. Um, I guess the relation to inertial uh, sensors is that this may be a neat way to do um, uh, frequency matching, and I hope to uh, convince you of that. So I'd like to present our work on a new electrostatic actuator that we call the perfect electrostatic anti-spring. Uh, my co-authors on this work are two of my graduate students, Shai Shmulevich and Inbar Chotzen, um, who couldn't attend uh, the conference today. Uh, Svetlana, you want to move if you want to see something. Okay, so uh, I will begin by uh, discussing frequency tuning and gap closing resonators and frequency tuning and comb drive uh, resonators. Then I'll present our novel device and show some experimental verification of its response. Uh, I will also include in my presentation a new device and new data which are not included in the uh, extended abstract, and then I'll conclude my talk. So in gap-closing electrostatic actuators, if we apply a harmonic uh, voltage, we can operate the system as a uh, resonator, and such uh, uh, resonators can be used as uh, sensors, filters, uh, and oscillators. And it's always nice, we can uh, extend the functionality of uh, the system if we can tune the resonance frequency. And of course, uh, we can do this if we increase the DC voltage, we can decrease the tuning because we see that um, the stiffness uh, is affected by the electrostatic um, of the system. Uh, however, since the stiffness is a nonlinear function of motion, if we increase the VDC, we get um, a, of an effect on the gain, on the sharpness, and we can see that we can um, induce nonlinear effects such as uh, duffing, softening, and so on. In contrast, electrostatic uh, comb drives are well-behaved actuators. The electrostatic force in these devices is a function of voltage, but it is not a function of motion, which means that actually we cannot modify the stiffness using uh, voltage. Um, this is different, however, if we look at comb drives where we have shaped fingers. Um, so the idea of um, using shaped fingers dates back, I guess, to the uh, PhD of Wen Jing Ye in Cornell in uh, 98. And uh, what she showed is that we can compute a specific geometry for a finger such that the, for a fixed voltage, the electrostatic force is a linear function of motion. So again, this is for a fixed uh, voltage. And therefore, we get a constant stiffness, but here we also get a bias force. Now, this idea was extended in 2003 by Jensen and co-authors. And had, they had this brilliant idea that we can actually look at a symmetric arrangement of the same system. Now we have a backside stator here on the other side, and it actually applies a negative force to the rotor, uh, the amplitude of which increases with negative motion. So if we look at the forces from both sides and we combine them, the resultant force is in fact um, linearly related to motion with no bias. So this is for a fixed voltage. Um, so actually what we have here is a perfect um, electrostatic spring with a negative stiffness. And this has been used in uh, recent years by uh, Gary Feder's group to do parametric uh, resonance. Um, other than that, we haven't seen much use of this very brilliant idea. And I guess the reason is that um, there are many technological limitations to this. First of all, the gap is not uniform. It means that the fringing fields are non-uniform. They're not constant. So uh, first of all, in our design process, we have to take account um, of uh, the fringing fields. It also means that uh, if we have a certain plan form, as shown there on the right, this plan form is correct only for a specific device layer thickness. If we have a different thickness, we mess up the fringing fields, uh, the plan form is no good anymore. Um, also, if we have um, a, a uniform over or under edge of our fingers, again, we're messing with the uh, fringing fields and therefore this device or this design is very sensitive to fabrication inaccuracies that would produce wider or narrower uh, fingers. 
On top of that, uh, since we're using curved um, uh, fingers, our combs are necessarily sparser, which means they pack in less force. And if we want to do curved beams, we need high resolution uh, lithography. Our new device is a symmetric system. We have a double-sided comb drive uh, actuator. Uh, this is the rotor. Uh, these two stators are uh, connected. They're shorted together. What you see uh, special about this device is that the length of the fingers on the rotor are linearly, uh, tap linearly tapered. Okay, So we apply a VDC to our rotor, and both stators are shorted um, and grounded. It can be shown, and we have the details in the paper, that the capacitance between the rotor and both stators is a symmetric quadratic function of motion, which means that the electrostatic force is linearly related to motion. Okay, so in a regular spring, a linear mechanical spring, um, the um, restoring force is linearly related to motion, and here what we see is that we have an electrostatic diverging force which is linearly associated with motion. This is why we call this an uh, anti-spring, and we hope to demonstrate and convince you that it's perfect. So since the force is linearly associated with the motion, uh, what we have here is a constant negative stiffness, which is a function of voltage squared, but this stiffness is not affected by motion at all. Uh, since we're not driving this system, it's going to be different for the new device I'll show you, but since we're not driving this system, the equation of motion takes this very simple form. There is no force here, and what we see immediately is that omega squared, the uh, natural frequency squared, is related to voltage squared. So this is a very um, um, clean relation, and we don't predict any additional uh, nonlinear terms. Um, just notice that for a given voltage, the system is a linear system, okay? So we can affect the stiffness, but the system for a fixed voltage is linear. Um, this device may be affected by fringing field, and there are two types of fringing fields that we want to look at. So the first is an out-of-plane fringing field. What we see here is a cross-section. This is one rotor finger in between two stator fingers, and we have fringing fields on the top and on the bottom. But since the gap is uniform, these, these fringing fields are just a constant factor. Okay, so here on the top view, what we see is that overlap area may be a quadratic function of motion, but the fringing fields themselves are just a constant factor. There is another type of fringing field. Uh, this is a top view of two fingers, and this is the fringing field of fingers that are about to be intertwined. Um, this is also a constant factor, because if we look at this top view, there are two such fields on each side of the rotor, and though their location is changed with the motion of the rotor, there are only two of them. So again, this is also a constant factor. Therefore, uh, these two types of fringing fields may affect the scaling of the device, but they do not impair the linearity. Um, so to demonstrate this, uh, here is a typical device that we fabricated. This is just a mass with a negative electrostatic spring. We see here the tapering of the fingers. Uh, this is a passive device. We apply an impact, and what we measure with a laser is the um, decaying vibrations. Now, we use diagnostic tools to uh, look at this um, decrement and see what the uh, frequency is with, uh, as a function of decaying amplitude. And what we see here in these diagnostic tools is that we have a very vertical backbone, which suggests that, indeed, our system is linear. We, um, we're presenting here the uh, analysis for two different settings of the tuning voltage, 15 volts and 50 volts, and this is why the natural frequency has two different uh, values. But in any case, it looks uh, fairly linear. Um, so the initial um, unloaded frequency was about 970 uh, hertz, and as we increase the tuning voltage from zero up to 80 volts, we can down-tune the uh, natural frequency by 80% down to about 170 hertz. Um, this is interesting, but m what is more interesting, here we see frequency squared as a function of voltage squared, and this plot looks fairly linear. These are experimental results. If we look at the uh, linearity of um, 
these results, they're ridiculously linear, which um, for us confirms our um, uh, model predictions that frequency squared is indeed related to voltage, uh, voltage squared. Uh, the new devices that are not included in the paper that I want to discuss now, we did hear the following. Uh, this is something that we fabricated in uh, Soymont's run 43. We connected here back to back two devices. The lower section here is a regular double-sided uh, comb drive resonator. Um, and here we have our new anti-spring. So the rotors are connected and they're both subjected to a VDC. The two stators of the linear resonator are subjected to opposite polarities of an AC voltage. So this is where we drive the resonator. And the two stators of the anti-spring are subjected to VDC minus V-tune. And V-tune is going to be our uh, tuning voltage. This is a typical device here. What we can see is the normal uh, comb drive of the uh, resonator, the double-sided uh, resonator. And this is the linear tapering of our stiff um, electrostatic stiffness. Again, we measured the response with a laser vibrometer. Um, actually, we included all this material um, in an abstract that we submitted to an upcoming conference. I won't tell you which it is. It just hint that it's in January in San Francisco, and this was rejected, so I'm at liberty to present the results here. So um, here is a frequency sweep of the resonator. This is the velocity when we apply no tuning voltage. So what we see is we sweep the frequency, we get a very nice resonance response. Now, as we apply more and more tuning voltage, what we see is that we're down tuning the resonance frequency, but Look, this is totally clean. We're not affecting the peak velocity at all. So we're not affecting gain, okay? If we actually take all these frequency sweeps and we shift them and overlap them, what you can see is that the 3 dB bandwidth is also entirely unaffected. So there are non, no nonlinear effects. Um, furthermore, if we look at the peak velocity, as we expect in a linear resonator, Peak velocity is a linear function of the AC voltage that we apply. So we see a linear uh, relation. This is neat. Now, if we downtune the resonance frequency, we see uh, that not only we maintain linearity, but it's precisely the same scaling. So we know precisely that for a given VAC, we know what the peak velocity is going to be, no matter what the resonance frequency is. And for this device, as for the previous, we see that we have a very linear relation between frequency squared and um, tuning voltage squared. Um, so to conclude, we demonstrated um, a perfect tunable anti-spring. We can tune the resonance frequency or tune the stiffness with this device. Uh, we have no additional forces. We have no observable nonlinear effects. The design is really simple uh, and robust. The fringing fields are a constant factor and do not affect the linearity of the device, and therefore this device is, or this design is insensitive to fabrication inaccuracies such that would produce narrower or wider uh, comb fingers. Um, we can use the exact same plan form for any device layer thickness. Um, it's compatible with low resolu resolution photolithography because we just have a Manhattan uh, architecture. And um, because we're not using curved fingers, we can pack in uh, more fingers per area and get more force. Uh, our future work, which actually my students already have begun doing, is um, since we can tune uh, the stiffness of the system with voltage, we want to modulate stiffness in time which means we want to operate this device as a parametric resonator and demonstrate that we can um, get a perfect Meissner and perfect uh, Mathieu uh, resonance. Um, thank you for your attention.